digital signatures have become a part and parcel of the everyday correspondence in the corporate sector. The pandemic has further accelerated the need for digital wares to become mainstream in the business world. While we have already learned regarding the DSA algorithm, which is exclusively used for verification and transmission of signatures, the RSA algorithm can be used for general data encryption and decryption as well. Functioning on a similar public key cryptography architecture, it is seen as a more complex solution to bolster security. Let us take a look at the topics to be covered today. We first get a recap on what asymmetric encryption is and how is it any different from symmetric encryption. We learn what digital signatures are and how they are used in today's world. We understand how RSA system works and how it can be used to encrypt and decrypt general data apart from the digital signatures. Finally, we learn about the advantages RSA provides when it comes to managing signatures and encrypting information in a professional environment. Let's take a look at what asymmetric encryption is. Asymmetric encryption uses a double layer of protection. There are two different keys in play here, a private key and a public key. The public key is used to encrypt the information pre-transit and the private key is used to decrypt the data post-transit. This pair of keys must belong to the receiver of the message. The public keys can then be shared via messaging, blog posts, key servers and there are no restrictions for it. As you can see in this image, two keys are working in this system. The sender first encrypts the message using the receiver's private key, after which we receive the ciphertext. The ciphertext is then transmitted to the receiver without any other key. On getting the ciphertext, the receiver uses his private key to decrypt the ciphertext and get the plain text back. There has been no requirement of any key exchange throughout this process, therefore solving the most glaring flaw faced in symmetric key cryptography. The public key known to everyone cannot be used to decrypt messages and the private key which is known to everyone cannot decrypt messages. It doesn't need to be shared with anyone. The sender and receiver can exchange personal data using the same set of keys for as often as possible. In the current scenario, if we have two people, Mary and Roy, who wants to send messages to each other, Mary must use Roy's public key to encrypt the information before passing on the ciphertext to Roy. On receiving the ciphertext, Roy can use his private key to decrypt the data and get the plain text back. Like we highlighted earlier, both the keys belong to Roy, who is the receiver in this particular interaction. We now have a revision on how asymmetric encryption works. Let us understand what digital signatures are and how they work. The objective of digital signatures is to authenticate and verify documents and data. This is necessary to avoid tampering and digital modifications or any kind of forgery during the transmission of official documents. With one exception, they work on the public key cryptography architecture. Typically, an asymmetric key system encrypts using a public key and decrypts with a private key. For digital signatures, however, the reverse is true. The system is encrypted using the private key and it is decrypted using public key. Because the keys are linked together, decoding with the public key verifies that the proper private key was used to sign the document, thereby verifying the signature's provenance. In step 1, we have M, which is the original plain text message. It is passed on to a hash function denoted by HH to create a hash digest H. Next, it bundles the message together with the hash digest and encrypts it using the sender's private key. It sends the encrypted bundle to the receiver who can decrypt it using the sender's public key. Once it decrypts the message, it is passed through the same hash function to generate a similar digest. It compares the newly generated hash value with the bundled hash value received along with the message. If they match, it verifies the data integrity. In many instances, they provide a layer of validation and security to messages sent through a non-secure channel. Properly implemented, a digital signature gives the receiver reason to believe that the message was sent by the claimed sender. Digital signatures are equivalent to traditional handwritten signatures in many respects, but properly implemented digital signatures are far more difficult to forge than the handwritten type. Digital signature schemes in the sense used here are cryptographically based and must be implemented properly to be effective. They can also provide non-repudiation, meaning the signer cannot successfully claim they did not sign a message while also claiming their private key remains secret. Further, 
some down repudiation schemes offer a timestamp for the digital signature so that even if the private key is exposed, the signature is valid. To implement the concept of digital signature in real world practice, we have two primary algorithms to follow the RSA algorithm and the DSA algorithm. The former is a topic of learning today. So let's go ahead and see what the RSA algorithm is supposed to do. The RSA algorithm is a public key signature algorithm developed by Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir and Leonard Edelman. The paper was first published in 1977 and the algorithm uses logarithmic functions to keep the working complex enough to withstand brute force and streamlined enough to be fast post deployment. RSA can also encrypt and decrypt general information to securely exchange data along with handling digital signature verification. Let us understand how it achieve this. We take our plain text message M. We pass it through a hash function to generate the digest H, which is then encrypted using the sender's private key. This is appended to the original plain text message and sent over to the receiver. Once the receiver receives the bundle, we can pass the plain text message with the same hash function to generate a digest and the ciphertext can be decrypted using the public key of the sender. The remaining hashes are compared. If the values match, then the data integrity is verified and the sender is authenticated. Apart from digital signatures, the main case of RSA is encryption and decryption of private information before being transmitted across communication channel. This is where the data encryption comes into play. When using RSA for encryption and decryption of general data, it reverses the key set usage. Unlike signature verification, it receives the receiver's public key to encrypt the data and uses the receiver's private key in decrypting the data. Thus, there is no need to exchange any keys in this scenario. There are two broad components when it comes to RSA cryptography. One of them is key generation. Key generation employs a step of generating the private and the public keys that are going to be used for encrypting and decrypting the data. The second part is the encryption and decryption functions. These are the ciphers and steps that need to be run when scrambling the data or recovering the data from the ciphertext. You will now understand each of these steps in our next subtopic. Keeping the previous two concepts in mind, let us go ahead and see how the entire process works starting from creating the key pair to encrypting and decrypting the information. You need to generate the public and private keys before running the functions to generate ciphertext and plain text. To use certain variables and parameters, all of which are explained. We first use two large prime numbers, which can be denoted by P and Q. We can compute the value of N as N equal to P into Q and compute the value of Z as P minus one into Q minus one. A number E is chosen at random satisfying the following conditions and a number D is also selected at random following the formula ED mod Z equal to one and it can be calculated with the formula given below. The public key is then packaged as a bundle with N and E and the private key is packaged as a bundle using N and D. This sums up the key generation process. For the encryption and decryption function, we use the formula C and M. The ciphertext can be calculated as C equal to M to the power E mod N and the plain text can be calculated from the ciphertext as C power D mod N. When it comes to a data encryption example, let's take P and Q as 7 and 13. The value of N can be calculated as 91. If we select the value of E to be 5, it satisfies all the criteria that we need it to. The value of D can be calculated using the following function which gives it as 29. The public key can then be packaged as 91,5 and the private key can then be packaged as 91,29. The plain text if it is 10 which is denoted by M. Ciphertext can be calculated to the formula C equal to M to the power E mod N which gives us 82. If somebody receives this ciphertext, they can calculate the plain text using the formula C to the power D mod N which gives us the value of 10 as selected as our plain text. We can now look at the factors that make the RSA algorithm stand out versus its competitors in the advantageous topics of this lesson. RSA encryption depends on using the receiver's public key so that you don't have to share any secret key to receive the messages from others. This was the most glaring flaw faced by symmetric algorithms 
which were eventually fixed by asymmetric cryptography structure. Since the key pairs are related to each other, a receiver cannot intercept the message since they do not have the correct private keys to decrypt the information. If a public key can decrypt the information, the sender cannot refuse signing it with his private key without admitting the private key is not in fact private anymore. The encryption process is faster than that of the DSA algorithm. Even if the key generation is slower in RSA, many systems across the world tend to reuse the same keys so that they can spend less time in key generation and more time on actual cipher text management. Data will be tamper-proof in transit since meddling with the data will alter the usage of the keys. The private key won't be able to decrypt the information, hence alerting the receiver of any kind of manipulation in between. The receiver must be aware of any third party who possesses the private key since they can alter the data mid-transit, the cases of which are rather low. Hope you learned something interesting today. If you have any questions regarding this topic, feel free to ask us in the comments below and we will be happy to answer your question. Thank you for watching. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.